Good morning from Luxor. Our host has kindly offered to drive us around the major sites of the city today. And considering the fact that we only have one day here, it's going to be a whirlwind trip. But it should take in everything that we want to see, so super excited to get started. Let's go. now arrived to the Valley of the Kings. So what is the Valley of the Kings? This is a site that has been used for about 500 years between the 18th and 20th dynasties of ancient Egypt as a burial ground for kings and royal family members as well. As a result of its significance in ancient Egyptian history, this has been an archaeological site on and off for the best part of the last two to three hundred years and they have discovered a lot so far. Up to now, it's believed that there have been 65 uncovered tombs and it's very possible that there may be hundreds and potentially thousands of them. So we're going to go and check out some of the open ones that have been recommended to us by not just the internet but also the people at the ticket desks. So we start off with the one which is the tomb of Ramses IV. coming out of Ramses the fourth tomb. Just wow. That is what a well-preserved tomb looks like. We thought that up until now we had been seeing tombs that were well-preserved, but my goodness, the bright colors that decorated the walls and the ceiling in there, they could have been painted today for all I knew. That's how bright and vibrant those colors were. I think the tombs are so well preserved simply because of how they are cut into the rock and they're not exposed to any kind of sunlight. But as well preserved as the hieroglyphics in the tomb are, it's interesting to learn that these tombs were actually robbed during antiquity. I think especially now that we've seen the colour and how vibrant tombs could be back in the day, then it gives me definitely an all new appreciation for how each of the things that we've seen should have looked like back when they were first built. So yeah, that was a huge eye opener and honestly just everything there was stunning. Absolutely amazing. Makes me really excited for the next couple. So I can't pronounce the name of the one we're going into next. I will give it a try. I think it's Merenta. Thing, something like that but yeah that's the next one so let's go in we just came out of the tomb of Maremta 
I feel like I'm probably butchering that so badly and I apologize. It was way bigger than the Tomb of Ramses IV, but the hieroglyphics in it weren't as well preserved. Don't get me wrong. They're still probably better well preserved than anything else we've seen in Egypt up until now, but it's just in comparison to the first tomb we saw, there seems to be more damage and more parts that are whitewashed, but the parts that do have color are still bright. Absolutely. I think the most impressive thing in there is not just the size of it, but also just the sarcophagus. Because you could clearly see all the inscriptions still on it. The effigy of the pharaoh was still very much intact to the point where you can see basically all of the detailing on it. So it kind of feels like as we go through each of these tombs, we're getting a real sense of what all of this should have looked like, not just from necessarily a interior decoration perspective, but also in terms of what the tombs would have looked like as well. I just wish I could understand the hieroglyphics because I'm sure the tales they have to tell about their Egyptian mythology and daily life would just be fascinating. Absolutely. Uh, again to be an Egyptologist then. <laughs> I think we're now gonna go into our third and final tomb, which is that of Ramses III. That was really, really cool. I think this one is one of the larger tombs in the entire Valley of the Kings site, from what we understand. And it was absolutely massive. I think it was just really interesting though, because with each of the three tombs that we've seen, there's generally the same hieroglyphics which are on each of the different entrance ways. So that's kind of all uniform, but then how each of these tombs then start differing is in some of the other decorations that are included and the sarcophagi and all that kind of thing. So with this one, because it is so big, it has a bunch of different niches, it has annexes and all of that kind of stuff. And so as a result, it was depicting a number of other stories that came out of Egyptian mythology that I've never seen before. Not from any of the pyramids we've been to, not from any of the tombs or any of the temples that we've been to. So really that's what made this very, very unique. The only downside with that one though, is we got through all of that, all the way to where the tomb should have been resting, only to find that it had gone. Some parts of it have gone to the Louvre, other parts of it have gone to the museum in Cairo. So that's a bit of a bummer, but of course, they have to find ways to preserve this amazing history that has been found here. So. It's disappointing from a punter's perspective, but it is completely understandable from a cultural preservation perspective. What about you? Again, I know I keep saying this over and over again, but I just cannot get over the hieroglyphics. What an incredible way to record your history. And just from what they're saying with how it tells of their daily life and their beliefs and mythology, these people had such a rich culture and they lived much more simply than we did because we don't live off the land anymore, but they had the same type of life. You know, they had family life, they had religious life, they were hunting and gathering and farming and eating their food. And so it's just so interesting to imagine what their simple life would have looked like and how similar it is to ours today. We always focus on the differences, but that I think is because of technology. But really, we're more similar than we think. And you can really see why this has been made a UNESCO World Heritage Site. It is so important to preserve this history and to learn about these peoples and their culture and to make sure that this doesn't get destroyed. Agreed. I think the other aspect to this is the fact that they were able to do this with such simple technology like you've alluded to. The fact that like all of these huge monuments, all of these massive temples and things like that were erected using just relatively basic tools, simple machines to get 
the structures that we've been able to appreciate during our time here in Egypt, it's it's mind-boggling. It's amazing to think the level of craftsmanship and engineering that has managed to go into this in spite of the lack of technology that there would have been over 3,000 years ago. And to think that it has stood the test of time, we don't build this well anymore. Things are just not built to last nowadays in the same way that they were here. I'd be curious to see the sorts of monuments that would stand the test of time in a few more thousand years' time if people were trying to discover how we built. I don't really know where we're going next. No, it's definitely somewhere in Luxor, and it's definitely somewhere impressive. But uh, I guess we'll find out. We are now in the middle of exploring the temple of Hatshepsut. I don't know why I always have such a problem saying her name. She was one of the only female pharaohs of ancient Egypt, and she had a prolific reign in the sense that it was very peaceful, and she's also known for building a lot. She actually built the Temple of Karnak complex, which is an absolutely iconic and famous temple complex, which we're hopefully going to see later. And then, of course, she built this to commemorate her life and her father. And for that reason, then this actually has the distinct title of being a mortuary temple. So this is actually a hybrid building, which is a little bit unusual for ancient Egypt, whereby not only is this a dedicated temple, because this is dedicated to Hatshepsut herself, as well as the Egyptian god Amun, but it is also a tomb to her father, Tutmos I. I think in terms of how well the building has stood the test of time then it's really amazingly impressive and it's great because you can get to see what an architectural marvel this really is especially for its time considering in fact it was built three and a half thousand years ago so that in itself is great I think the only Thing that maybe this is a little worse than in terms of the other stuff that we've seen is just the inscriptions. But that's mostly just because obviously this is very much an open air temple, so therefore there has been some weathering, there has been a bit of sun damage, and it just means that the inscriptions are a little bit harder to make out. But all the same, you can definitely see the glory and the purpose behind this temple, and it is just very, very impressive considering its time. No idea where we're going next, but let's head where we're going. We've just arrived to the Valley of the Queens. The tickets were each 120 Egyptian pounds which equates to about $5 each. If you want to go into the tomb of Queen Nefertari, then you're looking at 1,600 Egyptian pounds. So we decided to pass on that.
So the value of the queens is a little bit of a way away from the value of the kings, but it seems that burials were taking place here around the same kind of era in between the 18th and 20th dynasty of ancient Egypt. This, the Valley of the Kings, and also nearby Thebes, which is now modern day Luxor, actually were all put onto the UNESCO World Heritage List in 1979, which means that one can probably assume that the discoveries were all starting to be made here. But in terms of the number of tombs, then I think it's even more than the Valley of the Kings. The Valley of the Kings, to our knowledge, has 65, whereas this one has up to 110. And the vast majority of these are dedicated to wives and children of the pharaohs, whereas the pharaohs themselves were built in the Valley of the Kings, of course. If you are interested in saving money, then the Valley of the Queens is less than half the price of the Valley of the Kings. There's also barely anyone here. So if you want to avoid the crowds, those are two good reasons that you could come here. Yes, the tombs are less prestigious in that they're the wives of the pharaohs, but I mean, Queen Nefertari is buried here. So that's someone pretty iconic. And the tombs may be a little bit smaller, but the hieroglyphics, the color of them is just as intact and bright and vibrant as it is at the Valley of the Kings. So I think if you need to choose one because you're on a budget or you don't like crowds, come here. I mean, of course you could go to both like we have, but this is a fantastic place to visit. Welcome to what we think is the final leg of our trip around Luxor. This is Karnak. After having just walked through some of Karnak Temple, my mind is absolutely blown. This place is massive and imposing. It is absolutely huge and it's stunning and it's crazy to think that the only part of this that is actually available to the public is one of four different parts. That means there are three other parts which, while smaller, actually make up this entire complex. So that should hopefully give you a sense of the scale of just how big this place really is. It's amazing. What also makes this amazing is that while obviously this was built progressively over time, over the course of a couple of thousand years, initially construction started about 4,000 years ago. So that's when the foundation stones were laid, that's when you first started seeing this complex coming alive. That plus the sheer scale of what has come around as a result is just mind blowing. just got back after being out exploring Luxor for seven hours. We left at nine and well, it's now past four o'clock. 
our host Ahmed, who drove us around, did this for 35 US dollars, which was 1100 Egyptian pounds. I think this is one of the best deals we've got since being in Egypt. He took us to all the right places. He was always there waiting to collect us. He took us to like grocery stores and to get water and juice when we needed. The so, breakfast that he sorted out for us was traditional and delicious and cheap. Just he could not have been more kind and helpful. And I think just in general, even beyond that, just the way that he's kind of taken care of us and made sure that we're at home, obviously gave us this gigantic room upgrade and everything, and it's been awesome. So, um, big fan. Big if fan you come us. to Luxor, stay at Enjoy Luxor. Well worth it. In terms of what we've been able to see today, then what is it? So, I the kings, I the queens, take a look at ships. So, wow, even I That is a it. mouthful. Even I have trouble with it. Um, and then Karnak Temple Complex. And then a quick stop at an alabaster factory as well. So today has been jam packed, but I will say that everything we've seen here today has been so impressive just based on the quality of the hieroglyphics we saw in the tombs and then the size of Karnak Temple Complex. It's vast. Us talking about it, the videos that we've got, the photos we take in, like, none of that does it justice mm -hmm. at all. If you are coming to Egypt, you just have to go. It is as simple as that. If I am being super harsh and you have limited time in Egypt or you have a limited budget, so you need to pick what to do while you're in Egypt, my top ones would be Cairo, Giza, and then Luxor. Yeah. Everything else we've seen has been incredible. And I'm sure there's still more we could have done, but definitely in terms of what is so worth seeing, those are the three that I would pick. Those are my highlights. I think it depends purely on the overall experience you want to get out of it. If you are somebody who's looking more ahead to kind of medieval history for Egypt and all that good stuff, then certainly there are places we've been to in like of Cairo, Alexandria, and all that good stuff, which are worth going to. If you are wanting to do like pure ancient Egypt though, then definitely Giza, what we've done in Luxor today, and then I would say Abu Simba, like skip us one altogether, just go straight there. Mm -hmm. I think that would be my top three if you're going to come here. But all in all though, the fact we've been able to jam back that all into our time in Egypt has been super special. I know Rachel has been working extremely hard to make sure that this has been the best experience for us both at the cheapest rate as well because fundamentally if you go through most tour operators and things like that it's hellishly expensive yeah so my dilemma here was i needed to keep it cheap and i needed to keep it safe and it needed to include everything that we wanted to see but nick had more on his list of things he wanted to see than i did <laughs> and when I looked into tours that included everything we wanted to do, it was going to come to over 2300 Canadian dollars. And don't quote me on the exact price that I've been able to do this for because I've been keeping track, but it hasn't been precise. But I would say we will have been able to do this for about $1,200 to $1,300 total. So I've saved us about $1,000. And there is a way you could do this cheaper. You have to keep in mind that in order to keep us safer, I have opted to always get transfers organized by our accommodation. We definitely could have negotiated more at certain points. But I think that this was a really good middle ground and what we were comfortable with. People warned us about safety before coming here and that people would be constantly nagging you for money or taxi rides or to buy their wares or trying to lead you astray or asking for tips. And to be honest, that really hasn't been my experience while we were here. We were asked for tips, but actually just by the driver. So it really wasn't too much but no one else has really asked us for tips at sites. We've been asked if we wanted tours or to buy water and so on, but a simple no thank you generally has been sufficient. 
you will say there's been a few instances where you've had to be firm or say it a few times, but just nowhere near the amount that I've expected. I have had a really lovely time here and I felt really safe. So come here and experience the very friendly people, the delicious food and the incredible history. I would say more or less the same. Like I was expecting kind of verbal wrestling matches. Basically just get people away from us when they're going to try to hustle for anything, really. So the very fact that we haven't experienced a single one of those films out that actually has been pretty smooth and to be honest with you, it's kind of really if you've been to Morocco or like any other North African country, it's more or less the same, to be honest with you. I think Egypt might actually be a little bit more chill. Yeah, I think Egypt is a bit more chill than our experience in Morocco. Yeah, but this is particularly special, I feel, for me, because I have wanted to come to this country for probably at least 25 years. And the very fact that we've been able to do that, get to see everything that we both wanted to see. and. We've been able to do it in a way that is conducive to our whole round the world travel budget as well. It's it's been so special, genuinely. So it really has been kind of more or less everything I wanted it to be. And so with that, thanks for But we are going to be spending the next couple of days just moving on to our next country. So that's really exciting. So with that, then we'll see you as we travel to the next country. Until next time though, take care. And keep smiling.